I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled about the two presentations that are coming. Not that I haven't been thrilled about the presentations that have already happened, all right? Um, this whole issue with respect to um, micro microgrids and reliability and, and everything else is, um, I, I think it's a really, really big deal and, and we have um, two special folks that know about this stuff and you need to hear what they say. Uh, we, we have Lisa White with Passive House USA. Um, she has a master's degree in engineering from the University of Illinois. Who knew that the University of Illinois had engineering? That's a joke. It's <laughs> You're spectacular, and thank you for telling us about the limitations and the, and, and the necessity for matching buildings to the grid network. Lisa, take it away. Thank you, Joe. All right, so like Joe said, I work with FIAS, uh, formerly known as Passive House Institute US. So why am I talking about the grid? Um, seems a little disconnected, right? So I kind of got into this stuff in my master's program, started learning about energy generation, utility markets, things like that, and being at Passive House and understanding you know, what we're doing, building load profiles, net zero building. I realized like what we are doing has such a significant impact on the utility markets and the utility and power generation and we are creating such a transformation in all of that so what I want to talk about today really is the grid and then our opportunity as building developers, designers, operators and all of that to help facilitate the change that we're trying to make in the electric grid. So we'll talk about decarbonization, renewable energy integration but really I want everyone here to understand um, the opportunities that are coming with this in this large network that hasn't changed in, in quite a bit of time and, and what the challenges and changes are that are happening right now. I have a feeling I'm gonna have a hard time with the clicker. Um, okay, so most of us don't really think about where our power comes from, right? We just like flip the light on. Flip the light on. This is going to be hard. Um, and, you know, they turn on, right? And we're, we're happy and we don't really think about it, right? We don't really question it until it's gone, right? And then we're like, what the hell's going on with this, right? And then maybe you think about it. People in Texas are learning more and more about their grid, right? After a failure, they're like, huh, you know, questioning everything. Or um, we talk about flooding resilience, right? And we, we saw the vulnerability of our transmission lines, not only from fires, but also flooding. So... There's a lot of existing infrastructure that's super vulnerable, and our buildings on the other end of it are vulnerable too, right? So let's get into it. Stand back a little. Okay. So the grid. Um, I don't know who coined this, but I think they coined themselves as the biggest machine on earth. Uh, it is made up of three different interconnects in the U.S. So I'm going to be talking about the U.S. electric grid, but I think this applies pretty globally. Um, so we have Western, Eastern, and then Texas on its own, which again, a lot, a lot more people are aware of now. Um, don't know who made that decision either, but okay. Uh, so these different regions are kind of split up into smaller regions called independent service operators or ISOs. And it's really, really complex what's happening. I mean, you might think, oh yeah, these crazy control rooms, right, controlling the grid. But it's actually really antiquated. Um, all of the operations, this is, neither of these are actual grid control rooms. I don't work for a utility, I, I, I don't know. But I do know that a lot of the infrastructure is aging and there's actually, relative to the amount of change we're seeing in other industries, it's taking this industry a really long time uh, to catch up with that. So just generally, general overview of the electric grid. Um, we have power generation on one end, and then we have transmission, distribution, and a customer load on the other end. Unidirectional power flow, this is how most of the grid in the US works. So what happens is the customer load increases, we turn our light on, whatever, we turn our AC down, and the power generation gets that signal, and immediately, must increase, right? It must immediately match our load. Um, instantaneously, we want an un uninterruptible power supply, and that is really, really a challenge. And it's gonna become more of a challenge after we start integrating some of these other uh, energy sources, which I'll talk about. 
Um, and it's, it's vulnerable. Um, one-way communication, have you ever had a one-way one uh, discussion? One person's talking, the other person's listening, how effective is that, right? So the supply must always meet the demand, and we're getting to a point where the demand needs to start talking back to the supply. That's what I'm gonna get into. So just generally, the grid mix is made up of fossil fuel-based resources and renewable resources. Uh, this is from the EIA, so we got about 35% natural gas. These are the generators that produce the electricity. Um, coal, nuclear, and then about 15% renewables and 7% hydro. Uh, renewables we know is increasing, right? And even in this plot from the EIA, let's see. In the last like 10 years, it's gone up 10%, and we know that's increasing, right? People are making pledges to reduce emissions, and a lot of that is gonna come from utility infrastructure and increasing renewable energy in the grid. So the load profiles that the grid sees are fairly predictable, and they're fairly seasonal. Um, so the winter, there's generally a, a peak in the morning and then a peak in the afternoon. And in the summer, there's a peak in the middle of the day. And in terms of the whole, the grid peaks in the summer right now. And these different parts of the load are met with different generation resources. So we have base load, and that's met with coal, nuclear, and maybe some renewables like hydropower. Constant output, running all the time. Um, yeah, full output. And then we have load following uh, generation resources, generally natural gas, maybe some renewables, something that can respond to when the load increases at the customer end. And then we have peaker plants, and I think this is maybe a term that's gaining a little more um, awareness, but when we need to meet that very end of the load, we have these, these uh, generation resources that will run constantly but not output power until we get to this peak. And this is the really, really expex expensive electricity. They call them spinning reserves. So we have them spinning and running and operating, but we don't actually get anything out of them except to meet these peaks. And then hydro is shown there too, because hydro is kind of essentially a form of energy storage if you want. It's dispatchable, it can, it can respond to the load. All right, and then in terms of capacity, um, base load capacity runs all the time in terms of utilization. And then load following capacity runs most of the time to follow the load during a day. And then we have this additional peaking capacity uh, to meet that peak at the end of, the, or at whatever the peaking point is in the day. So, we have a lot of redundant capacity on the grid, about two to three times what we'd actually need if everything ran full out, because we have to meet these peaks. Um, so if you consider, you know, we understand peaks, right? Let's, let's bring this to like a building scale. You design a building, you calculate a peak heat load, you buy a mechanical system that meets that plus 20, 30%, right? Imagine then, they say, okay, well, can, this, can you get a heating system that can run your whole neighborhood? Like, well, how much, how much fudge factor do you add to that, right? And then if you can't control the heating, can't control the thermostats, the buildings can't share it, what do you add to that? So we have this really redundant, uh, lots of redundant capacity, significantly overbuilt system because we're trying, it's the one-way communication and we're always trying to meet that peak. And kind of showed this earlier, but meeting the load, generally, so the way it works is they bid into the market, all the generation resources, you take the cheapest first, and then um, call upon more and more expensive resources later in the day to meet that load. So the last kilowatt hour is the most expensive, and generally also has the worst emissions. The clicker's gonna, okay. So another way of looking at this is scheduling. So down here on the, the TAN chart, you can see different generation resources bidding into the market at different costs. Um, the good thing about renewables is the fuel is free, so they can bid in at really low cost. So generally, renewables are used first when they can be, and then we call upon other resources as the demand increases up that line. Um, notice it's not linear also. Like once we get to a certain point, it's, it's exponentially more expensive to continue to meet that load. So bringing down that peak is really important, foreshadowing. Um, and then on the left there, you can see real-time pricing for the Chicago market. Um, I think I just took a, a week or something. And you can see it's really, really dynamic. Uh, most of us are exposed to a static price for electricity, 12 cents kilowatt hour or something. That's just pretty much insurance so that you don't get exposed to those peaks. So it's a little bit more than it might actually cost them on average, um, but it's insurance to kind of shield you from that vulnerability in pricing. 
but that's the cost that actually costs the utility to provide power at that, that given time. And then as a result of that, the grid mix is different at every hour, every minute, every second, maybe. Um, and there's different marginal emissions because the, the different generation resources have different emission factors, right? So this is a chart from watt time, um, a graph from watt time kind of plotting Chicago in 2019. So it's a little, little old now, but the months of the year are across the top and then the hours in the day on the left. And you can see some hours are good green, good relative to the bad, and some are red. Um, but generally, like this is how we look at energy use in buildings. We're like, <laughs> every hour is the same, right? Like, you know, kilowatt hours a kilowatt hour. We're trying to reduce energy use. But we need to start shifting, and I'll, I'll get more into that. Okay, so getting back to kind of the, the grid mixes and the different ISOs, uh, just to show you kind of how the loads are met in different places in like the existing grid, this is from the New England ISO, so right here, uh, this is about a week ago, and you can see there's a forecast, so you forecast what the load's going to be the next day, what, um, what actually happened, and then what cleared the market. And then you can see the generation resources used to meet that. So you have your base load, might as well just stand back here at this point, um, your base load nuclear, and then you have uh, hydro and renewables kind of at the bottom, right? And you can see how flat nuclear is. Uh, it does not change, it does not change output, really, really hard to do so. And then you can see natural gas is kind of that load following um, resource. And if you're like interested in this stuff, there's so much information. When I found out about this website, it is a whole new world, um, really. You can go in and see you know, all the different market forecasts and what the actual emissions on the grid is at any point. Um, and all the different ISOs have these. It's a really, really complex process of projecting and meeting the electric load every single day. <clears throat> And then this was new since the last time I looked at the website. Um, this is the actual load on the grid in New England, including behind the meter solar. So the solar energy that people have put on their buildings that the utility can't see. So you can see that kind of it's a much bigger hump in the day than, um, than this load shows us, right? And we'll get into a little bit more of that. But they can't see it, so I'm just saying. They cannot see it, they are estimating that this is what people are using. So they're taking past probably load data and saying people are probably gonna use this much. We don't know how much solar they have because it's, again, no, no communication there. So roughly this is what we think is being used. And remember, they have to plan for whatever the net of that demand curve is. So the grid's changing. Um, it's antiquated, it's being electrified, it's being decentralized and digitized. So I'm mostly gonna talk about the decentralization and the electrification part. Um, I am definitely no expert on microgrids and all the digitalization and communication protocols between buildings and all of that. But I, I hope to scrape the surface of some of these concepts for you guys so you can kind of understand the importance of them, the order of magnitude of some of these changes. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know too much about the actual digitalization of the grid. Okay, so the, the best example we have right now as an example of a new grid in the US is California. Um, they're ahead of us, right? So here's their demand trend, same day that I showed New England ISO. Looks very similar. Here's the renewables trend, um, shocking. Big sun in the middle of the day. And then here's their net demand. Um, so we're creating this really significant ramp at the end of the day, and most of us know this is the duck curve, or call it, I've heard it called like the Loch Ness Monster Curve now some places too, and maybe Hawaii, I think it goes below like the, I don't know, it doesn't matter. This is the duck curve, um, and it's creating significant problems for the utility based on the, re the resources they have available to meet that ramp. So they don't know when the solar's coming on, especially if it's behind the meter, so they have to shed the generation output that's happening at, their, at the utility. And then whenever the sun goes down, they have to ramp up really, really quickly to meet that load. And the other thing that's happening is congestion on the transmission lines. So this is the same day that we were looking at um, for the California ISO. This is from the California ISO. 
And this is just trans this is congestion happening because there's not enough transmission to get the renewables to the load. That's it. There's not enough wires, or the wires aren't big enough. Um, so we have renewable energy that is just being wasted because the timing isn't right, right? Or there's not enough storage at one end or the other, something like that. So this, this is, I just picked a day, but they all kind of look the same. Did I skip some? No. Okay. So then this is kind of just to get you guys looking a little bit past um, what we saw with 2022 in the grid mix. This is from NREL. It's a, called their Cambium model. And this is kind of projecting out um, what the grid mix will be in 2050. So you can see generation on the left and capacity on the right. So capacity is new infrastructure that will generate um, electricity and then generation is how often that resource is actually used. So if a resource has some capacity and is used all hours of the day, it's gonna have similar amounts of generation in terms of the total piece of the pie. So what we are trying to do or what we need to do is, be, is basically increase utilization factors of renewable energy resources so that that generation piece of the pie um, is bigger for the renewable energy. Because ultimately the generation, that bucket is what controls emissions. Or not what controls, what, what dictates the amount of emissions that are actually associated with the electricity. It doesn't matter if I have a bunch of PV if it's not being used, right? So we're trying to increase utilization factors of renewables. Um, and you can see by 2050, the projection from NREL, which I think this is from 2020, and this was like with policies in place, this is where we will be. So it's not really guessing, it's just saying if everything plays out and no new bills are signed or no new commitments are made, this is where we'll be. It's a really significant chunk of energy from distributed solar and um, utility solar, and then we have some wind also. So as I'm talking, I want you guys to think about as we transition to a renewable future, which I do believe we are going to with this grid, how do the decisions we make at the building scale impact what they have to do at the other end of the picture, right? We can't just continue thinking in silos. It can't be a one-way communication. Um, I, it's cheesy, we're all in this together though, right? Like, so we need to talk to each other. Um, not just the people, but the, the networks as well. Okay, so on to changes and challenges. There's a decarbonization movement, um, or at least I see one. Uh, their net zero buildings are becoming more and more common, and it's great. Um, things are being electrified. Everyone says electrify everything. That's how we're gonna get to zero, right? It's great. Um, and we're also kind of with this, replacing these dispatchable fossil fuel energy generation resources with variable renewables. So I use those words intentionally. Dispatchable means it can answer to us. If you want to increase it, you can increase it, right? So our fossil fuel resources, most of them can respond. Not most. Natural gas is pretty much the only one that can really quickly respond. But we can't tell the sun when to shine or the wind when to blow. So they're, they're variable resources, not dispatchable. They're not at our, at our wishes, unfortunately. Okay, so I'm kind of going to talk about the challenges with the grid in terms of these three objects. There's a lot going on here, a lot of moving pieces. I'm going to try to stay in the building realm um, as much as possible given the, the time here. Uh, so speaking of time, timing is important. Um, so net zero is a great goal. I think it's a great goal and it's great that there are so many people picking up on it, people are proud of it, and it's really great, but I think we all understand here the typical definition of a net zero building is you produce as much as you use on an annual basis. So you smear it out over a year and it's like, okay, I have enough PV so that what I use over, over the course of a year is zero. Um, but that doesn't mean no impact. That doesn't mean you're not attached to the grid. Although I think my friends still think I might work on like off-grid homes or PV. They don't, yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> it's, it's confusing to many people, right? Um, but it doesn't mean you're off grid, it doesn't mean there's no emissions or anything, it just means I calculated how much energy I'm gonna use and I'm gonna make that much energy too, clean energy. And I, I do think as this is becoming more common, there's kind of two flavors of zero, or two types of zero. There's the buildings that'll, 
basically be code compliant and then buy enough PV to get to zero. So I'm going to call that case one here. We're going to look at two different net zero cases. And then there's buildings that conserve energy first, thoughtful conservation, passive buildings. I actually haven't used that word yet, I don't think. Um, passive buildings where you reduce loads first and then you add renewables to get to zero. So we're going to take a look at two different case studies here. Um, Chicago multifamily building. Um, it's a DOE prototype, so it's, it's not a real building, although I'm sure some look like this, but it's, it's not a real building. Um, two of them use solar energy to basically get to zero over the course of the year. The first one needed 290 kilowatts, and the second one needed 160 kilowatts of PV to offset that um, over the course of the year. And they have the same, um, same tilt, all of that. And for those that don't know about passive building, I just have to do one slide on it. Um, if you take a typical building and apply passive building strategies like a good enclosure, air tightness, balanced ventilation, things like that, you can really reduce heating and cooling loads um, at the peaks and over the course of the year. So we're minimizing those peaks and we're minimizing the area under that curve. So this is what I'm talking about when I talk about passive building in the simplest context. Okay, so these two buildings, these two multifamily buildings, these are their load profiles in blue, baseline on the left, fee is compliant on the right, and then the PV output required to offset that over the course of the year is in yellow. So, sure, right. What I want to point out here, though, is if you look at the baseline building versus the FIAS building, the loads, the relative loads from one another are reduced, right? I don't know if this one's exactly 50%, 50 but you can usually see about 50% less annual energy use and 50% less in, in peaks for space conditioning loads. I'm generalizing because there's a lot of climates in the U.S. This is Chicago. That would be very common in Chicago. And because those peaks in the buildings are less, the solar peaks are less too, right? I need less renewable energy to offset that annual uh, building load, so now the solar peaks are less. This is just another way of looking at it, wrap it around a circle here, baseline building, we're taking that blue blob and offsetting it with that yellow blob at the top, and then the, the passive building, smaller blobs, All right? Okay. And then you zoom in on a day, I'm beating a dead horse here, but you zoom in on a day and the mismatch between the, the baseline building and, the, and the, um, the PV production that it has is pretty significant. And then you, you lower the loads, lower the amount of uh, renewables needed to offset it, and they get a little closer, right? But passive or not, the grid's still required for a lot of the energy supply. Um, we know the sun only shines a certain amount of the day, right? But when you reduce the load, that's about half of the annual energy use that the grid actually has to account for. Um, so you're alleviating, alleviating a little bit of that stress. So with net zero buildings, consumers are also becoming producers, right? Um, they call this distributed energy resources, or DER. Not just this, but distributed renewables around are called DER, those that are not centralized with utilities. And here's the big bad duck curve. Uh, this is pretty old. But this is Cal the California grid, right? The PV is coming in the middle of the day, so that's, that's what you're seeing in the belly of the duck over here. Um, and then you're seeing significant ramping, right, happening at different points in the day. And this is not just California anymore. So I went and looked at the New England ISO, just looking up duck curve, and I think this is from 2018, and it, it predicts in 2019 that Massachusetts grid would be kind of at the top of that green, that top green dot. It'll have this amount of solar, so this is roughly where the Massachusetts net load's gonna be. And then just for fun, I looked at April and the New England grid, and here it is. It's here. The duck curve is here in New England. So the net load is that, that belly of the duck right there, and then the actual use is that yellow line across the top. Significant ramp. I mean, this is not just California anymore. And this is all because of really renewables coming in at the middle of the day. <clears throat> The reason this is really tough is, again, because the generation resources that we have available to meet that ramp can't meet that ramp. So we have coal, we have nuclear. Those don't change. Those don't want to change. They definitely can't change that quickly. So really, the only resources that can meet that, that quickly would be energy storage um, that can fully dispatchable or natural gas. 
Um, so you, you'll probably see a lot of predictions of the future of, as we add more renewables, natural gas will be the one that kind of supports it, follows that load until we can uh, lose reliability on that. But this is really hard also because they're required to meet this load, right? So whatever it costs, this is what they must meet. And they're supposed to turn down generation resources and then turn them right back up. And sometimes it's just literally not physically possible. So looking at the, uh, that same multifamily building in Chicago, um, I'm going to move faster. Um, this is the, the typical day that people look at the duck curve, March 31st. Um, let's make a community of a thousand of those buildings, that, those multifamily buildings, and then let's start to offset percentage of them with solar energy. So on the left, we have the baseline building, and you can see with no solar energy, kind of follow the track the top of the curve, um, that's the load. And then as you integrate, okay, 10% of them are net zero, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. Um, that's that bottom green line. So you see we're creating the duck curve, right? With that same multifamily building, but with the conservation first approach, saving about 50% of the energy, flattening the peaks, you can see that, again, less renewables is required, so it doesn't bring the duck or the, the belly down quite as much. It's not peaking quite as much. And the ramp at the end of the day isn't quite as significant. It's the same amount of buildings, um, just flattening that load and reducing that load helps significantly in this ramp scenario. So passive buildings can dampen it, right? But they don't really help the communication piece. Like, just inherently the passive buildings can help those curves. Um, and then as we talked about, not all kilowatt hours used are equal. Um, so what do we do about that? Pass a building, flatten it, uh, lower it, good, right? But what else? Um, so we know the marginal emissions are going to continue to be dynamic, especially as we add more renewables, we actually might get more jumps um, when you have to jump between strictly renewable energy and then fossil fuel based. So we need to start to focus on when instead of how much, or maybe not instead of. We need to also focus on when instead of how much. Um, so we saw, this is a, we have a lot of these, daily load profiles, um, power in the y-axis or whatever, energy, kilowatts, and then time of day in the x-axis. And generally we just think every time we use energy it kind of has the same impact, right? So it's a brown color. But in reality, with our, our most grids right now, conventional fossil fuel grid, we know as we're getting higher and higher, uh, the, the load on the grid is getting higher, but also this building is getting higher. The higher ones actually have worse impact, right? More emissions. So maybe we need to start to shift our load toward the green, right? Makes sense. So for this building, the, for the original load was gray, and now we're, maybe we need something like the black, right? But what if you're a net zero house and you have PV on your roof? Then the exact same load profile looks bad in the morning because you're taking grid energy. In the middle of the day is actually when you should be using energy. It's green. So maybe in this scenario, you'd want to push more of your loads to the middle of the day. So two exact same load profiles, but with different data and um, different signals could result in two very different optimized uh, loads or load profiles. Okay, so what we need to do, be able to do is enable the building loads to be smart and responsive to signals. So who's heard of GEB? What a fun acronym. Yeah, okay. GEB. They just skip the I, but it's fine. Um, so this is a grid interactive efficient building. Achilles, were you in You're smiling. Is this your fault? <laughs> okay. Um, so grid interactive efficient building, um, at least they used efficient in there. So we're enabling these building loads to be smart. And this is just a generic diagram. Um, but really what it is is it's looking at all the different loads in the building and figuring out how they can be dynamic and respond to those green and red lines, the signals from the grid, whatever that is, emissions factors, cost, um, stress on the grid, whatever it is these different systems should be able to respond. Um, I'm mostly going to talk about HVAC because that's where, really where passive buildings shine um, and really where they differentiate from all of the other buildings in terms of the everything else in that chain. Um, 
but you're really looking at all the different loads in the building and allowing some sort of signal, some sort of data to allow you to change when you're using energy. And this is really at the building level. At the individual building level, you can have a GEB um, and you can integrate all or some of these loads. You can also um, integrate PV and storage if you want, so generation and storage. <clears throat> And kind of the main things in the GEB toolkit are load shifting. So that would be if you know you have a load, but you can do it at a different time in the day. Um, so this could be things like uh, appliances, you know, dishwasher, I want to make sure it's done by 6 p.m. or whatever, 8 a.m. Um, it doesn't really matter when it's done, as long as it's done by then. Or um, space conditioning loads, right? So it's focusing on when the energy, energy is being used, but it's a load that actually has to be met at some point. And then load shedding is just straight up reducing a load. So you can also do this with space conditioning systems, but also lighting or dimming lighting and things like that. So in the GEB scenario, we go back to the grid. We have our power flow, high stress on the grid. The customer now gets a signal to reduce the load, or they do it automatically. Um, and they drop their load, this is a demand response. Um, I realized not too long ago that I was very familiar with this at an age that I didn't even know what this was. Um, so growing up, we were in central Illinois, I guess we had a plan where if it was a hot summer day, the, the power just went out from four to six. You just sign up and it, it'll turn your power off. And I'd go home from school and I couldn't get in the garage door, so I'd spend a lot of time in the backyard after school because I couldn't get in the house because you can't get in the in the house. And I I didn't know what it was. I was just like, oh yeah, we just don't have power right now. So, I mean, it's existed for a very long time. Um, so it's not a new concept, but it's a little abrupt to take all of your power. Um, but if we don't have smart enough systems to, you know, only do some of it, it's like it's on or off, right? So we're off, fine. Um, but now we can have different pieces and say, we don't actually need this right now. So we can shed that. So then there's an additional synergy when you connect grid interactive efficient buildings with passive buildings. So you saw Geb talks about you know, electrical energy storage, but what about thermal storage? Um, so shedding loads, not a problem for passive buildings. Al, I think we'll talk about a little bit about Revive, our next speaker, and um, resilience and shedding loads, not a problem. Um, and also shifting loads. So I'm guessing a lot of people in here have a Yeti. I've seen a lot of Yetis around, and I have my own Yeti thermos. But essentially, you know if you put ice cubes in there, you're going to be fine like five days from there. Like, these things are nuts. Same with the, the thermos. Like, I put coffee in there at 8 a.m., and it's still hot at 5, right? It doesn't matter when you put it in there if you have that good enclosure. So maybe you just put a little in at a time or heat it up a little bit at a time when that resource is available, but it doesn't really matter when. And that's really what passive building adds to... Um, to the whole GEB scenario, right? You can, you can have any building that's um, grid interactive, but adding that extra layer of uh, thermal capacitance, I guess, or resistance in the enclosure um, allows the building to be way more flexible, way bigger load flexibility. Okay, so let's talk about electrification. Uh, just very briefly, electrified water heating, I think, is going to be a really big player, or it's, reports say it will be a big player, I don't know, um, on, with helping the grid. Um, so you can essentially heat the water at different points in the day, not just when the water heater says, okay, we clicked to a point where we like lost temperature or something like that. So essentially it's additional thermal storage or additional load shifting. And um, I think a recent GEB report said 50% of the, the loads controlled in buildings would be uh, hot water and space heating. So I'm not gonna get too deep into that. Um, but I do wanna talk about this. So the peak, on the grid is, is changing. Um, it is going to shift to winter, and this is a pretty big deal. We're electrifying heating systems. So right now the peak on the grid is in the summer. Um, there's, yeah, sure, there's cooling loads in the US, but the, man, are there heating loads, right? So we're electrifying, we're adding heat pumps, um, and we're shifting that whole load of the grid, that peak capacity that the whole grid is sized on the summer, we're shifting that to the winter, and we know that's higher. At least those of us that live above, you know, the Mason-Dixon line or whatever. Um, we know it's higher, so the heating load is higher. So we're gonna look at two scenarios and how this kind of impacts the grid. So let's go back to a typical versus a passive building. Um, 
I'm using simple numbers and I'm also going to maybe talk faster if possible. Um, so I got a lot of simple numbers coming up, math, charts. I know you guys love it, so just bear with me. Um, so this is a typical daily load, um, the winter load in the morning and then the afternoon. And the typical building has a load of four, peak load of four, and then the passive building, we cut it in half. It's not unrealistic. I think I'm actually being generous here. Um, so then let's step out and let's say there's three of these buildings. What is the grid C? So we have three buildings, with the peak, each with a peak load of four. Four plus four plus four is 12, okay? And then passive buildings, each with a peak load of two. Two plus two plus two is six, right? Okay, that's half. And then we add in GEB, and we say, okay, we can shift. I'm not gonna shed any of this load in the passive building. I'm just gonna shift it to a different time in the day so that these don't align, so that the grid isn't seeing the coincident peaks all at the same time. And then maybe we can reduce it to four. I don't know, I'm just making up hypothetical scenarios here, but it's significant. And if you don't believe me with peak heat loads, um, this is just a, a sample building from one of our optimization studies that was used to set the FIA standards. And looking at two different buildings in Minnesota, single family home, this is an extreme case, Minnesota, but looking at a 2009 building America benchmark, like not a bad building, and, and then passive building. And looking at the, this is an annual load profile now, uh, the heating load on that bottom. And the difference between the baseline building and the passive building is a factor of three. Like, so this is two, I'm being generous, okay? So this is, this is significant. And what I wanna point out is that a lot of existing buildings that look like that orange line are being electrified, right? And if we don't bring them to that green line first, we're gonna have, sig we're gonna have the exact same problem we have right now with significant um, capacity needs and um, infrastructure needs that are gonna cost a lot of money and take a much longer time to roll out than if we first deal with the root of the issue. Okay, into microgrids. I, might, I probably won't make it on time, I'll be close. Um, okay, so microgrids. I'm not gonna get too deep into this. I, I don't know if there's an actual scale that has to be a microgrid, but it's, imagine the big grid, but smaller. Um, <laughs> So uh, the biggest difference, I think, is the concepts and the way it works. So instead of just one-way communication, it's more of a mesh. There's more resilience built in. There's different avenues for power to travel from generation to a load. And kind of some of the key component, components are buildings with grid-enabled loads so they can be optimized, generation and storage, and then some sort of manager, someone to manage that system, someone, something, some, something. It's not going to be a person. Um, and maybe EVs, maybe other things. Again, I don't want to shift focus too much from buildings. So we have demand, storage, generation, all that, and a manager. And this manager has a lot of important questions to ask, and I don't know who's going to program these or code these, but um, you have to think if a kilowatt hour is produced within this microgrid, where does it go? But it has the information of all the different building loads that are connected to that. So it might know what the next best critical load is. Um, and in times of excess supply, it can determine, okay, should I, should I put it in this building as thermal storage? Should I store the battery? Should it go in this car? Um, but it has all the data that it needs and is capsulated. It took a really big problem and made it small so that it was able to look at, like actually try to solve the problem and look at optimizing that. And then if a building adds a new load, how should it be met? Renewable energy, storage, does it even need it? Can we shift it? Things like that. So that's what this manager is gonna be responsible for. Oh, yeah, I wasn't gonna accept that I was day two so I couldn't show pets. So, <laughs> this is my dog, Flynn, um, oh, last week. Um, but now we're getting into winter peaks, so this is him stern in the Chicago um, winter. He loves snow, you can't really tell in that photo, but he does. Okay, so how do microgrids in these winter peaks react? Where's that synergy? Um, so we know the peak's changing. Um, and we're gonna look at a couple different scenarios. So we have these baseline buildings. We're, we're talking about this same fake building with the peak of four and two, okay. Um, so we have nine of them now. And they're on a central grid. So they all have a peak heat load of four. Nine times four is 36, okay? That's what the grid's seeing. 
Now we add the GEB shifting. Two. The peak load is two at any given point because they're like, okay, I'll shift two to the two to the morning and two to the evening or whatever. Whenever they're going to shift it, they're never going to actually reach four because their signal is telling them not to. So the sum of those, nine times two, is now 18. And now I have microgrid control. So I have the GEB load shifting, and then I also have someone looking, or something looking over this and trying not to exceed a certain peak. So maybe these three get the load, and then these three, and then these three. I don't know what it'll be, but something like this. Now the peak per building is still two, but they offset each other. And now the grid peak is six. Okay, so you see what's happening here? It's already reduced by a factor of six just by having the intelli intelligent communication and ability to kind of respond to signals. And the biggest difference here between the base or between the middle scenario and the far right scenario is that um, typically utilities will have demand response, but all the buildings are getting the same signal right at the same time or controlling the same thing. So they don't. The utility could try to do it, but they don't necessarily have the um, information available to say, do these buildings and then these and then these and then these. I mean, they're dealing with a lot. So when you get it into a microgrid scenario, you can see the interrelationship of the different building loads, which adds that additional synergy on top of shifting and shedding. All right, beating another dead horse, but passive building, half the load, right? Some coincident peaks 18, then we add shifting and shedding. Now we're down to one as the peak because we shifted it. What, one here, one here. Um, and now we're at nine, and then with the microgrids, again, three at a time, we're at three. So you can see how these kind of tap into each other, right? You start with the baseline building, centralized grid, everything's coincident, nothing's talking to each other, nothing's responding. And then you add these elements of passive and controls and a centralized system that manages all of that, not at the grid level, but at the microgrid level. And we can reduce that by a factor of 12. Again, these are made up numbers, but you get the picture, I think. I hope. If not, I'd, I'm not quite sure what else to say. <laughs> um, okay, I'm pretty close to the end. Uh, other benefits, uh, just that it don't show up in winter heating loads, so let's maybe step away from that for a second. Um, we have the vulnerable transmission, right? So microgrids bring the generation closer to load. We don't have to rely on all those existing lines. Um, long, long, I mean, we saw vulnerable to weather, vulnerable to age, vulnerable to not being able to actually carry the load that it needs, right? So bring it closer, solve it that way. Uh, resilience, what if a line goes down? What if there's a fire? What if there's a flood? Um, you can intentionally island this group of buildings and they can provide their own resilience. Um, improving resource, renewable resource utilization. So improving the utilization of when that renewable energy is available. Because again, it can get the signal of when it's available. Aligning the demand with the supply. And then basically, I mean, I, the way I kind of think about it is you just take a big problem and you just make it into littler problems and then solve them that way. Like we kind of do that every day, right? Or we take a little problem and we like step back a little bit and the solutions are different. So that's, I think, just taking the problem and making it smaller so that we can actually utilize that data is, is kind of one benefit of the microgrid. And then energy independence, um, something that I think is going to be more of a concept just not relying on vulnerable fuel prices or, you know, I won't get into that, but less vulnerability to the central utility, um, to fuel prices of, across the world, things like that. Um, being able to generate and use that energy when it's generated and have a system that allows you to do that. Okay, I am over, but I'm not that far. Okay, so... Really what I'm talking about is optimization at each level in the design. Um, so passive building, you optimize the design to reduce loads. So we do reduce the demand and then considering we're shifting out our generation resources, our supply, we're reducing that supply that we need to meet that demand. Then we add GEB, so we optimize those loads, the remaining loads, enabling demand to align with supply. And then the microgrid kind of takes all those smart buildings and optimizes them all together with new generation and storage, maybe electric vehicles, things like that. 
So optimizing supply and demand to maximize the infrastructure and minimize emissions, hopefully. Some oh, microgrids don't need renewable energy. Maybe I should be clear about that. It can be any energy supply, but I think a lot of them of the future will be mostly renewable energy. Okay, and then the biggest synergies is when you tap into each, right? Combine them all together. And there's gonna be a lot of data exchange. I mean, I don't know much about this, but smart grid is becoming a thing where they have sensors along different parts in the grid, being able to understand when outages are happening sooner than others, um, and shutting down certain parts of transmission lines, things like that. So data exchange throughout this entire process and communication is potentially one of the, not the most key, but a very, very, very key component to this. Okay, final. Uh, countdown here. So as the grid load increases right now, generally what we do is we call on more resources, right? Just turn them up, turn the power up. Um, if we start with passive building and we, we reduce loads first, we can bring that down, bring the generation resources we need down. If we do GEB, we can bring that down even further. That's the wrong graphic, but that's okay. So is that, huh, okay. Um, it's okay. Um, we'll bring it down even further and need to rely less and less on the fossil fuel generation. So they all have a, a part to play. And if you skip one or the other, that's fine. I don't think everything in the future is going to be a Fias Geb microgrid, right? Like there's going to be other solutions, but when you can tap into some of these synergies together, um, we can really get to a place where we can harness the renewable energy available and get down to, to um, retiring all the fossil fuel based plants. So there's a ripple effect of conservation. Um, if you first reduce the load in the building, then you reduce the energy supply needed for it, the energy storage needed for critical loads, the transmission, the distribution, all of that. Okay, to harden these concepts, um, I want to apply them to a hypothetical situation, um, an open bar, right? Okay, so I was hoping at least if you didn't connect with the rest of it, maybe um, this will work. I don't have alcohol, just as concepts. Okay, um, so the grid right now, we have everything, drink as much as you want, we'll keep it coming, right? So that's business as usual on the grid. Is something wrong with that? Oh, there's, in no ways am I suggesting we change the hypothetical situation, but these are the concepts within this situation, okay? So the next concepts, okay, a participant only consumes about half of the average person, slow and steady. There's gotta be some of you guys out there, right? That's passive building. I don't know that it's the FIAS people, but that is passive building as a concept. Okay, so okay, we get really busy from five to seven, so if you only take the stuff that's in the coolers outside and you don't bug us at the bar, we'll give you a discount. So that's, that's demand response. Um, so I'm gonna bring my own empty, cool, uh, empty cooler, drink out of it whenever it's not empty. People can add to it whenever they want, but if I don't drink it quickly enough, I expect you to pay me for it. Anyone know what this one is? Um, okay, so if our taps run slow, we'll ask you to drink less, politely, periodically, but if they run fast, we're gonna, we're gonna hook you up to the tap and you're gonna drink real fast. <laughs> That's Geb, kind of. And the last one, we're gonna give you a keg, a tap, cups, and we're gonna put you in the corner and you can just distribute it amongst yourselves. Um, don't come to us unless it's gone. That's a microgrid, yeah, someone got it, all right. That is it.